Hello. Over the next 15 minutes or so, I'm going to talk to you about the role that the Nanga Parbat Massif, located in the western syntaxis of the Himalayas, plays in the generation of the sedimentary record in the Arabian Sea and Himalayan Foreland Basin. So Nanga Parbat lies in a syntaxis, and we know that Syntaxes can be important places for strong coupling between tectonics, climates, and surface processes. An example of this was seen in Alaska, where the work done by Ava Enkelman and her colleagues showed that in this bend, orogenic bend here, that the collision of the Yakutak terrain, starting in the late Miocene, resulted in uh, uplift of a tectonic aneurysm, a a localized zone of high exhumation rates uh, that is associated with the underplating of this terrain to North America. And the strong uplift coupled with the erosion related to the glaciation here has been feeding lots of sediment from this aneurysm area into the Gulf of Alaska. In a similar way, in the eastern syntaxis of the Himalaya, here over here in eastern India, and uh, southwestern China, we see um, a localized <coughs> tectonic aneurysm here, uh, which is ringed around by the Brahmaputra River flowing out of Tibet. And this tectonic aneurysm, this massif, the Namche Bawa massif, uh, is uh, known to be exhuming at very high rates, seven to nine millimeters per year, uh, based on basement thermochronology, and analyses of the river downstream of Namche Bawa indicates that around 60 to 70 percent of the sediment uh, in the river is actually coming out of this aneurysm. And you can see here the relatively restricted zone of high uh, exhumation rate shown by these hot colors and contrasting with the wider um, syntaxis here that has much lower rates of exhumation. So this begs the question about whether the same is true in the Western Himalaya. So over here in Pakistan um, and Northwest India, we have this big sweep of the Himalayas here, the Western Syntaxis, and within that, the more localized Namche Bawa Haramosh Massif, which represents a tectonic aneurysm. It's about 20 to 50 kilometers across and about 100 kilometers um, in a north-south direction. And uh, the highest grade material is focused here around the peak of Nanga Parbat, one of these famous eight kilometer mountains. And the question is, how much sediment is this producing? Is this dominating the flux in the Indus River in the same way that we see at Namche Bawa? Already you can see there are some differences between the two because the Indus skirts, mostly skirts the edge of the syntaxis and then um, of the aneurysm and then it cuts through here uh, before going into its upper reaches, whereas the Brahmaputra at Nam Namche Bawa is wrapping around the entire massif, so it's a little different. And earlier work has suggested that, um, that its erosional impact is not that great. So this is based mostly on heavy minerals and bulk sediment neodymium isotope data that suggests that it's not uh, a critical part of the sediment production process in the Western Himalaya. But we wish to test this in this study using um, zircon and rutile uranium lead dating uh, from both upstream and downstream of the massif and for the first time really characterizing what the basement itself looks like. So we do know that Namche Bawe is, uh, Nanga Parbat is a classic example of a tectonic aneurysm. There have been strong debates about its tectonic structure uh, which concerns us less in this particular uh, study. We know from basement uh, studies in the, in the core of the massif that it has experienced extremely rapid cooling since about 1.7 million years old. Um, it may well be much older than that. That is something which is currently under debate. Uh, maybe it has uh, just accelerated in the relatively recent geological past but what we want to know is, is this new fast-moving massif still a major source of sediment into the Indus River, and how does that affect the deep-sea record in the Arabian Sea? 
So we know something about that as a result of zircon dating that was done by um, Peng Zhou and colleagues now um, in review, almost in acceptance um, with G-cubed. Uh, and we're looking here at just the last 200 million years of zircon data uh, from a series of turbidites, as well as the basement rocks themselves, which you can see down here. And this um, yellow shaded peak for Nanga Parbat represents data that came from Peter Zeitler collected in the early 1990s uh, that emphasized very young uranium lead ages, uh, less than 10 million years old. And you can see that um, actually that type of peak is not very commonly seen uh, in the sediments of the Arabian Sea. Uh, and so this begs the question um, that, is, um, that maybe Nanga Parmat is not a, a big producer of sediment. The catch here is that the number of samples was not that great, and of course the sampling itself was limited and tended to be focused right in the center, in the highest grade part of the massif. And we wanted to know whether uh, that was more generally true. Was this a good fingerprint of the erosional flux from Nanga Parmat? So in order to answer that question, we take samples both from downstream at Atok, where the Indus meets the Kabul River, at Tarbella, which is a big dam here along the course of the Indus, as well as upstream in the um, Gilgit Hunza area, the rivers that are draining the western Karakoram, at Skardu, where rivers are draining the eastern Karakoram, as well as at Alchi in Ladakh in India, where we're looking at the erosional flux from the, essentially Western Tibet. And we add to that also new samples taken here at Taito on the western flank of the um, Nanga Parbat Massif, which is draining the core of the, of the structure, as well as over here at Gorikot. So Gorikot is also re receiving some material from uh, Kohistan, uh, but the bulk of the sediment flux appears to be coming from this very steep and heavily glaciated catchment on the west. So it has a mixed provenance, but dominantly Nangaparvat. And this should give us a better indication of what the erosional flux from Nangaparvat has been through time. So the results of our dating are shown here as a series of PDF plots uh, showing the spectra of zircon ages that we see in the different rivers and the basement sources associated with those. And we're showing one, uh, 0 to 3 billion on the left here, 0 to only 300 million on the right. So the sediments from Gorikot and Taito draining the Nanga Parvat Massif do have the young peaks that we saw in the basement rocks from the Zeitler uh, work in the 1990s. Uh, but we also see a very prominent 1.8 billion year peak here, which is similar to that seen in the Inner Lesser Himalaya. And this confirms the general association between the basement rocks at Nanga Parbat with those seen in the Inner Lesser Himalaya. Uh, when we look in more detail, um, you can also see that, um, that Gorikot and Taito are uh, a little bit dissimilar to one another in terms of their younger peak, the sort of 70 million year peak seen at Gorikot is quite similar to that found in the Trans Himalaya in Ladakh uh, and in Kohistan, probably reflecting erosion from that source. At Taito, the peak is more like about 100 million. The issue here is that this is also similar to a peak that we see in the um, at Skardu in the eastern Karakoram meaning that these young peaks are not unique in terms of their provenance. The one thing that we can say based on the zircon ages is that this rather prominent 1.8 billion year old peak is not seen to any significant degree downstream of Nanga Parbat at Atok. And this suggests to us that Nanga Parbat is not a very important source of sediment to the Indus River at Atok. So we can look at the zircon uranium lead data in a more objective fashion by employing a KS test that compares all the different rivers with the various basement sources in this table with blue colours indicating uh, materials that are similar to one another in their age spectra and red dissimilar. And so the thing that really jumps out to us here is that the river at Atok is very similar to the 
river at Skardu, draining the eastern Karakoram. When we compare Atok with basement rocks, you can also see a similarity uh, here with um, the Karakoram rather than any of the other basement sources. So what this tells us is that the river downstream of Nanga Parbat is primarily being derived from Karakoram sources, not from those in Western Tibet or from Nanga Parbat. So we can see this um, result a little bit more clearly here using the uranium lead ages from Rutile. The stream downstream of Nanga Parbat at Tarbella shows this very clear 10 million year peak. And it's noteworthy that this uh, is only seen, this population is only seen at Skardu in the eastern Karakoram. The western Karakoram and to a very large extent Nanga Parbat um, don't have that. Uh, peak and suggest to us that at least the flux in Rutiles is heavily dominated by the river at Skardu, draining the eastern Karakoram and resolving the ambiguity that we saw in the um, uranium lead zircon data. So we're able to do some mass balancing here using the results of this work uh, and what we see is that at Nanga Parbat the erosion rates are relatively moderate, 3 to about six kilometers per million years, similar to estimates from bedrock sources. Uh, we note that these are rather less than those seen at Namche Bawa. And although the massif, uh, the aneurysm massif at Nanga Parbat is a little bit smaller than what we see at uh, Namche Bawa, it's noteworthy that its contribution to the downstream river is much less, 17 to 19 percent compared to 61 to 70 percent in the eastern syntaxis. So the impact that the western aneurysm has on its associated river is much less than we see at Namche Bawa. So just to conclude, the zircon and rutal uranium lead data that we show as part of the study indicates that most of the sediment in the Indus is coming from the eastern Karakoram, not from the western Karakoram, not from Nanga Parbat. A relatively small amount of sediment contributing to the trunk stream of the Indus, 16 to around 19 percent, uh, relatively small. And by the time we get to the Arabian Sea, this pr proportion has gone down to around 9 to 10 percent of the total zircon load. And that represents further dilution downstream from sediments coming out of the Himalaya. So the sediment production at Nanga Parba is less than half that seen at Namche Bawa. And the reason for that is probably because first it's much drier, the western Himalaya is much drier than the eastern syntaxis. There's a much less prominent syntaxial nick zone. The um, nick zone in the, in the channel is very much reduced in Nanga Parbat compared to Namche Bawa. And finally, that there's a much weaker spatial relationship between the river at Nanga Parbat. The Indus sidetracks the massif and then cuts through it rather than looping in the way that we see at the Brahmaputra in Namche Bawa. Okay, thank you very much, and uh, if you have any questions, we'll take them now.